what's inside this crate is going in this 2012 Mustang. We'll show you how easy it is to install an Edelbrock E4 supercharger on a 2011 to 14 Mustang GT, and then we'll head to the chassis dyno and see how much power it makes. The Edelbrock E4 supercharger stands apart from other superchargers on the market in that the supercharger sits low in the valley. This arrangement allows longer, generously curved intake runners to increase flow and torque. The Stage 1 kit includes everything needed to supercharge your Mustang, including an OBD2 tuner, fuel injectors, plumbing, hardware, and even the required drill bit and metric bottoming tap. Let's get started. Before tearing into this Mustang, Edelbrock sent us a tune for our vehicle that we loaded into the PCM. Doing this first meant if we ran into any problems, we could resolve them before getting knee deep in the install. First, we disconnected both sides of the battery. Then, we removed the strut tower brace. After removing the push pin fasteners, we set the radiator cover panel aside. With the car on jack stands, we removed the bottom radiator panel. Next, we removed the screws holding the fender liners to the front bumper cover. With all the fasteners out, we removed the front half of the fender liner. Next, we pried the bumper cover straight away from the fender. We removed the two screws holding the bumper cover to the headlight panel. With all the fasteners removed, we unhooked the bumper cover from the headlight panel and set the bumper cover aside. Next, we drained the coolant into a clean bucket so we could reuse the coolant after we were done. Our 2012 Mustang GT has a Cobra Jet intake setup on it, but the procedure is pretty much the same for all intake manifolds. We started by removing the cold air intake, mass air connector, throttle body clamp, and intake tube. The purge valve on the Cobra Jet intake is at the left rear of the manifold, so we disconnected its electrical plug and hose. We removed the passenger side PCV hose, removed the heater hose out of the way, and removed the hose support. Next, we disconnected the heater hoses from each side. With a rag ready to catch excess fuel, we disconnected the fuel feed hose from the fuel rail. Then we pulled off the fuel rail insulator and disconnected the fuel injector electrical connectors on each side. After sliding the clamp up on the hose, we disconnected the brake booster hose from the intake manifold. Next, we unplugged the throttle body connector. Then we removed the intake manifold bolts and lifted the manifold from the engine. To keep anything from dropping down the intake ports, we covered them with tape. Using push pin pliers, we removed the foam bumper filler and set it aside. Then we removed the radiator deflectors from each side. Edelbrock supplies a longer bolt to replace this bolt on the front bumper. Using some blocks of wood to support the air conditioning condenser, we remove the bolts holding the condenser to the radiator. Next, we carefully slid the supplied intercooler heat exchanger into position behind the bumper and fastened it to the radiator using the four AC condenser bolts. We loosely set up the intercooler pump assembly on the bracket to allow for some adjustment after installation. 
we pre-installed the spring hose clamps on the outlet hose. Note how the outlet hose faces up and away from the pump. We slipped the pump assembly behind the front bumper and connected the hose to the heat exchanger. With the pump bracket installed, we slipped the supplied spring clamp into place. We drilled a one and an eighth hole in the passenger side radiator deflector panel to accommodate the intercooler return hose and connected it to the inlet of the intercooler pump. To give us some working room, we removed the coolant reservoir and the upper radiator hose. The Edelbrock belt tensioner and idler bracket attaches to the front cover. We removed a couple of the factory timing cover bolts. We needed to drill and tap one of the bosses on the timing cover. We slipped some spacers over the supplied drill bit to keep from drilling too deeply. Then we used the supplied metric bottoming tap to cut the threads. Note we turned the tap backwards a quarter turn after every clockwise revolution to cut the chips loose. With the necessary threads cut, we installed the tensioner bracket using the supplied fasteners. Then we bolted up the supplied spring-loaded belt tensioner and idler pulleys. Moving to the driver's side, we removed the factory belt and tensioner and replaced it with the supplied belt idler pulley bracket. To clear the supercharger, we used a 10 millimeter deep socket to tweak this coolant fitting slightly toward the outside of the engine. Next, we needed to close the spark plug gaps to keep the spark from blowing out under boost. We removed the covers, disconnected and removed the coils, and carefully pulled the plugs. We used a spark plug gapping tool to tighten the gap to 35 thousandths. Four of these tabs on the valve covers interfere with the fuel injectors, so we used an air saw to trim them off. We transferred the OEM intake manifold seals to the Edelbrock supercharger. The supercharger is pretty heavy, so we enlisted an extra pair of hands to carefully place it on the engine. Next, we installed and torqued the fasteners to spec in the sequence detailed in the instructions. Next, we prepped the fuel rails by installing the injector alignment brackets, fittings, lubricated the O-rings, and installed the injectors. Then we installed the fuel rails and the fuel crossover hose. We used a long breaker bar to load the tensioner and slid the belt over one of the idler pulleys. We assembled the brake booster hose and connected it to the supercharger manifold. Next, we transferred the purge valve to the supercharger manifold. Then, we removed the factory purge valve fitting from the OEM purge hose, transferred it to the supplied hose, and fed it between the back of the manifold to the purge valve. The factory PCV hose from the driver's side was transferred to the passenger side. Using the factory throttle body seal, we installed the throttle body. Next, we wired up the intercooler pump. Here's the relay. There's a ground that goes right here. And one leg of the harness runs down to the intercooler pump. The fuse holder is mounted here, and the power is tapped into the fuse box.
This ground interferes with the intercooler pump reservoir, so it's relocated over here. The relay trigger runs up here and taps into the purge valve. Note our purge valve harness was extended for the Cobra jet intake, so we just coiled it up. With the wiring done, we connected the reservoir outlet hose and temporarily hung the reservoir on the strut tower. The intercooler outlet hose connects between the supercharger manifold and the reservoir and is secured with two spring clamps. We used the supplied inlet elbow and installed it along with the factory airbox. Next, we connected the intercooler inlet hose from the heat exchanger to the blower manifold and used the supplied spring clamp to secure it. The intake air temperature sensor is separated from the mass airflow sensor, so we used the supplied harness and ran it from the air temp sensor up to the MAF harness. Then we installed the supplied PCV hose. We needed to trim the front bumper cover lower grille opening slightly on each end to clear the intercooler before buttoning up the front end. We reinstalled the coolant reservoir and hoses and filled the cooling system with the coolant we saved. The intercooler reservoir bracket sandwiches underneath the strut tower brace. A factory GT strut tower brace won't clear the Edelbrock supercharger, but the strut tower brace from a Boss 302 or a V6 Mustang fits with room to spare. After filling the intercooler system with fresh coolant, we twisted the key to the on position and made sure the coolant was circulating vigorously. Ah, the moment of truth was upon us, but the engine fired up on the first try and idled smoothly. While the engine warmed up, we checked for leaks and then went for a test drive. Our test drive confirmed the Edelbrock E4 supercharged Mustang was making a lot more power. But to find out how much, we put the Mustang on the chassis dyno at Boost Addicts in Gallatin, Tennessee. Our baseline was the stock engine with hooker 1 and 3 quarter inch long tube headers and a 3 inch exhaust system. It made 366 horsepower and 349 pound feet of torque on Boost Addicts Mustang dynamometer. Not too shabby for an otherwise stock engine, right down to the paper air filter. Now it was time to see how the Coyote liked some boost. Short answer, it loved it. A modest 7 PSI of maximum boost netted us 452 horsepower and 415 pound-feet of torque to the wheels. That's a massive 86 horsepower and 66 pound-feet of torque improvement over the baseline. The force-fed Coyote never makes less than 350 pound-feet from 2800 RPM to redline. That's what we call a fat torque curve. While we expected solid gains, what we didn't expect was the boost curve. Rather than starting strong and running out of steam like other Roots blowers, the Edelbrock's Eaton 2300 TVS rotors build boost as the revs climb, starting out at a little under 5 psi and finishing at 7 psi. This extends the torque curve and enhances top end power. We're now approaching the limit of the factory connecting rods, so we're looking forward to coming back to Boost Addicts armed with a built short block and a smaller blower pulley. We were extremely impressed with the fit, finish, thoughtfulness of installation, and performance of the Edelbrock E4 supercharger system on this mostly stock 2012 Mustang GT. We didn't have to cut any wires, relocate any major components, or make any other serious permanent modifications to this Coyote-equipped Mustang GT. And the car drives just like stock until you get deep into the throttle. And when you do, the results are well worth the effort.